Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Guillaume Long. He served as Ecuador's foreign minister in the Rafael Correa government. He's currently a senior policy analyst at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, Guillaume, Guillaume, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. So I'd like to start by talking about events in Bolivia. We've been covering it on this show uh, since the outset and a bit before, actually. Um, before we get to the coup and the sort of current aftermath, can you give people a sense of the Evo Morales government, what it was able to achieve, and a more, uh, let's say, holistic view than you're going to hear about it in the conventional Western press? Sure. Um, the Morales government was, I think, a unique moment in Bolivian history. Um, I think the regional context was a unique moment in Latin American history. So it's important to situate it in the context of a sort of region-wide um, advance of progressive governments and ideas um, all sort of committed to a, a post-neoliberal agenda is what they called it. So uh, an anti-austerity economic agenda moving away from the uh, neoliberal heyday of the 80s and 90s. So the 2000s, I would say the first 15 years of the 21st century were marked by what has often been called the pink tide. So um, significant growth, uh, reduction of poverty, reduction of inequality in the region, and it's really important to understand that the Morales government really inserts itself in that logic uh, and becomes, in fact, the Morales government becomes a champion of that logic. So you see Bolivia being one of the poorest re uh, countries in the region, uh, having uh, by far the, f the fastest growth rate in the region. Well, I mean, it depends on what window uh, of years you look at, but over the Mor let's say that over the Morales government, so the 13 years of rule of Morales, Bolivia grows at double the average growth, growth rate for Latin America, double. Um, but it's not just growth, it's also a reduction of poverty and inequality. So Bolivia is the big champion of reduction of poverty, and it's really important in the context of Bolivia, Bolivia which was one of the, mo the, the poorest countries in Latin America. So it reduces extreme poverty by 60%. I think this is record-breaking. Um, and it reduces um, uh, normal poverty or less extreme poverty by 40%. Um, yeah, it was a very redistributive uh, government, which also, uh, aside from the more material aspects of uh, these great social advances, was also important in ethnic and racial terms. So Morales himself was the first indigenous president in the most indigenous country in Latin America. Right. The most country in Latin, uh, indigenous country in Latin America, Bolivia, had never had a, an indigenous president. So Morales was the first one, and that was very important, very symbolic. Um, and it also meant um, um, and a real, I would call it, it's kind of put it in U.S. terms, a real civil rights movement accompanied by a pro-civil rights movement government. Uh, that a, included previously excluded sectors of society in the nation state project. And I think that's really important because what we're seeing right now after the coup is a return of the anti-indigenous, I would say uh, strongly racist uh, elites, but not just elites, also middle classes that, um, you know, have felt that uh, there's been too much equality and now all the ind these indigenous people want the same rights and the same, you know, the same treatment as the rest of them. And it's created a, it's created this very unfortunate and extreme hard, yeah, extreme right wing backlash, which we're seeing now. We always go back to on this show, this example from an interview with the uh, thankfully recently released uh, former president of Brazil, President Lula, who maybe we'll get to a bit later. But he told Glenn Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald specifically said, why is there this elite, essentially, why is there an elite backlash against you in Brazil when during your presidency, yes, the poor benefited the most, but everybody had growth. I mean, this was a you know win-win growth model. And Lula yeah. talked about, well, there were rich people that were basically upset. They said the airports look like bus stations. 
they were upset with a different class of people even just being in the airport. Not that they weren't at the airport anymore themselves, obviously. Can you, is that some of the sort of logic that we're seeing in Bolivia? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that is one of the most fascinating things that we're seeing happening, developing all over Latin America at the moment. Certainly applies to my country, Ecuador. Yes. Uh, some of the hardest uh, transitions, some of the hardest policies to pass politically were the ones that um, were symbolically, culturally, uh, really hard to stomach for the elites. You know, for example, um, what we call in Spanish uh, domestic workers, empleadas domésticas, yeah, in Ecuador, when those were given the minimum wage uh, with social security, with you know the the, the all the, the 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 benefits that any worker should have in Ecuador, you know, paid leave and sick leave and all this kind of thing. This was, uh, you know, fiercely resisted by the elites, you know, um, sort of kind of with the arguments that actually some slave owners used to use in this country. If you look back at the discourse in the 19th century, uh, sort of benign slave owners saying, oh, but we treat them really well. We really like them. They're like a member of the family. Well, you know, they don't need to be a member of the family. They need to have rights. Uh, they need to have social security. They need to be able to do something else at the weekend. Um, and those were the kinds of things that really drew the middle and the upper classes out on the streets. Um, so, I, yeah, I think your comment is absolutely valid. In fact, what we're seeing in Latin America right now is that the elites are a major hindrance to development. Uh, they're actually a major hindrance to the modernization of capitalism, let alone socialism or right. you know, progressive. Sort of. And what's fascinating is that um, I think the elites prefer inequality to prosperity. So they prefer they re their relative role in an you know, unequal um, society than to achieve this sort of, you know, however you want to put it, but to achieve development or this this kind of great leap, leap to a qualitatively different different society. Um, and that has a lot to do with um, the production matrix, uh, you know, the kind of plantation economy and the extractive economy and, you know, and the fact that we've had essentially rentist elites living from um, primary products and raw materials and commodities. I mean, there, there are a lot of analyses to do with that, but it's it's a uh, yeah, it's a very sad thing, and it's amazing that even these modernizers, and you mentioned Lula, he's certainly one of them, um, at the first opportunity, um, not all elites, because again, you'd have to be more precise in your description, in that, well, we would have to be more dis precise in our descriptions, but certainly a majority of elites, um, uh, as soon as they had an opportunity, we've just seen it in Bolivia, um, to, they've you know gone back to the old kind of semi-feudal ways of uh, ruling their countries. I'd like to get to Ecuador and the, the broader uh, regional dynamics and maybe even global dynamics in a few minutes, but can back to the Bolivia coup. Yeah. Can you, uh, I think a fair amount of people watching and listening are familiar with the broad outlines of this, but can you take us through all of the kind of key steps here from the and, and I'm not worried about relitigating the referendum and the Supreme Court. I mean, the, the, we could touch on that. It seems to me kind of ridiculous that that's a point of focus. But in the kind of main course of events now, there's a re-election campaign. Uh, there's an awarding of 47% of the vote, a, a winning of 47% of the vote, which means there's not a runoff. The OA, uh, the the Organization of American uh, States, they they question it without providing much sort of uh, evidence. And then uh, Morales, uh, you know, th then there's a really accelerated process up until today where we're seeing a, a coup government uh, engaging in, you know, uh, killing demonstrators, putting out decrees, criminalizing left politics. Can you just take us through this timeline and really ground everybody in how this coup has, how it happens, and how it's taking shape. Right. So, yeah, the elections took place on October the 20th. Um, and suddenly on October the 21st, so the day after the elections, uh, the OAS, the Organization of American States uh, um, Mission of uh, Electoral Observers, released a 
sort of uh, yeah funny statement i mean i've i've done some observations for them so i'm familiar of how they work i've been i've actually been the head of a oas mission observing elections in bolivia so i know i know pretty pretty much how it all how work works out and to release uh, such an aggressive press statement the next day is unusual Basically, the press statement said that they detected uh, things that weren't right and that they um, believed that it was uh, better to have a um, a second round, a runoff uh, between the two the two top contenders. It's very odd, you know, if uh, if someone's won, you know, in democracy, you win by one vote, you know, and without giving any real explanation or evidence to sudden, somehow say, you know, when in doubt, have a runoff, you know, certainly wouldn't be acceptable for, you know, modern democracies, you know, somebody yeah. have, suddenly have an international organization say, well, we're not so sure about this, maybe you should have, you should run the elections again, you know. Um, so that was very suspicious. And then two days later, they issued their preliminary report, which that's the normal thing to do, the OAS normally three or four days after the elections, they would have a preliminary report. And in that preliminary report, they made a number of accusations. Um, the main accusation, and I mean, in order not to get too technical, but the main accusation was that there was a change in the tendency of the vote. Um, there was the interruption of the vote count on the evening of the vote, and then when the vote count was reinitialized the following day, the day after the election, suddenly there was a change in the tendency, and it was seriously favoring Evo Morales. Well, there are two problems with that assertion. The first one is that the only vote count that was stopped is the quick vote count. So, as happens in a number of countries, Bolivia has two vote counts. One, which is called the quick count, which is something that's sort of very um, speeded up. It's based on taking pictures with actually with cell phones of the tally sheets in each one of the precincts. And it's, it's done by a private company. And the idea is that on the night of the elections, you know, you have a, a rough estimate of the election results so that the media can use and the people can be informed. You know, they, is it kind of like it's not the same thing, but is it sort of analogous to an exit poll? Well, it's more precise than an okay, exit poll. It's more precise than an exit poll. Okay. Much more. Yeah. An exit poll is you ask people coming out of the voting booths, you know, how they voted and they may tell you the truth or not. And it's right. this is this is much more. This is much more. The methodology is much more systemic and it's based on the actual voting tally sheet. You take a picture and you send it to this company and then all these people in the, in this company in Bolivia, it's a company called Neotech. They they really speed up, you know, they to, to, in order to give you a general a general picture of what happened on, on the election night. Now, the, again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the uh, Bolivia's electoral authorities had pledged before the elections that they couldn't do 100% of the vote. It was logistically too complicated. It usually is the case. Um, certainly when I was in Bolivia observing elections, they didn't do 80%. I think they didn't do 100%. I think they did 70 In this case, they said, we'll do 80%. And at 83%, they stopped counting. And it's true that 80, at 83 uh, percent on the quick vote, this is the quick vote, uh, Morales was certainly ahead. He was number one, but he didn't have that 10 point margin that you need in order to avoid a runoff. In, in Bolivia, in order to avoid a second round of presidential elections, you either need 50 percent plus one, like in the rest of the world, or as in some countries, f at least 40 percent with a 10-point difference with your next contender. Um, and he was on less than 10. Whereas the next day, when the vote um, count started again, Morales went past the 10-point margin. So, but this, the problem with this argument is that this was based on the quick count. And it's very unfortunate to see the media all around the world focusing on the interruption of this quick count. First of all, there was no wrongdoing. They stopped counting at 83% when they pledged to 80. And secondly, it's the quick count. It's not the slow binding official count. The slow binding official count, the one that's not based on pictures, the one that's done by the state, by the electoral authorities of the state, was never interrupted. And uh, it's pretty much followed what all the polls 
had suggested before, not all the polls, but the huge majority of polls that suggested before the Bolivian elections, uh, essentially that Morales would have more than 40% of the vote and that he would have that 10-point margin he needed in order to avoid a runoff. So, um, the... You know, statistical work of the OAS, the, uh, the, the people who, um, uh, yeah, I mean, basically published the preliminary report was, I think, very poor. Um, they completely forgot to mention something that happens in every Bolivian election, which is the fact that the late coming votes, the late, the votes that are counted later on in the process, tend to disproportionately favor Evo Morales over his contenders. Why? Because the Morales vote generally comes from the more peripheral areas, the more rural areas, the poorer areas of Bolivia. And those tend to report late. Um, you know, I think pretty much anybody can understand that. You know, when you're watching uh, election night on, you know, on, on television and cable TV here in the United States, you know, sometimes they can't call a state because, you know, such and such an area, which is known for being very pro-Republican or very pro-Democratic, has, you know, it's, you know that you're going to have heavy votes in favor of one or the other and that it's too soon to call. So that's exactly what happened in Bolivia. The pro-Morales votes came in late. Uh, and if you, we've, you know, we did, we've written a paper on this and uh, we've uh, you know, got, uh, I think, graphs that are very good at explaining what happened. There's no, unlike what the OAS argued, there's no break, there's no change of trend. It's a linear, it's a one line that shows that, you know, um, to just simplify things, that 10% of the vote, um, his rival uh, Mesa is winning, a 20% of the vote counted, I mean. Uh, they're pretty much on par at 30%. Evo's Morales is, you know, um, sort of taken over. He's in first place at 40%. That lead is, widens at 50, 60, 70%. It widens further, further, further until he reaches 100%. And then he has that crucial 10-point lead he needs in order to be able to avoid a runoff. And anybody, anybody, including the OAS, could have predicted that right. if they looked at the areas which hadn't yet been counted. Uh, in fact, since 2005, um, Evo Morales' victories are, you know, are late coming victories because it's that rural vote which for logistical reasons reports, you know, the, the tally sheets get to the, uh, to the authorities later. So it's, it's late at reporting um, that gives him um, that crucial victory. So I think it's uh, very suspicious that the OAS uh, did not detect that. Uh, it's very suspicious that the OAS, I mean, I've worked with them, I know them well, um, made a, a big deal out of that. Um, and uh, I strongly suspect that they did that for political reasons, which is why in the paper that we've written and the op-eds that we've been writing all week, we denounced the OAS for being uh, a major cause of that, of, of that coup because they, by saying that there was wrongdoing, they didn't use the word fraud, but then the media did. You know, they radicalized the opposition and protests became violent, and, you know, and things got out of hand and eventually uh, there was a coup. And I think they and played a major, major part this, in that. Absolutely. What have we been seeing this last week in Bolivia um, in terms of the rights situation and the type of government? You know, I there's a lot of cynical humor that you can make of it because in the kind of the first couple of days of the coup, there's a certain contingent, um, you know, I, people just sort of turn these things into proxy arguments for politics in the United States, essentially, is what most people do. Um, and and some people, you know, would sort of zero in on maybe, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe a valid objection to Morales on an ecological policy or something. And, you know, and, and my, my sort of tendency became, I'm going to, you know, tweet out a photo of some, you know, 
you know, the, the, the new government sort of planting a Bible and, or burning an indigenous flag, these obvious signs of, of, I would say, fascism, but at the very least, you know, extremism uh, and, and, and savagery, and, and then say, well, you know, actually, if you, you know, translates in Spanish as we object to the previous government's policies in the Amazon, you know, because people were still sort of replicating these ridiculous talking points um, to sort of deny what was happening. But it seems like in the last week, and this is not a good thing because the reports out of Bolivia have been so terrifying uh, and horrible. However, the it seems like unless you're really burying your head in the sand, the clarity of, of the kind of government that's taking shape here is becoming very, very clear. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think there can be, first of all, there's been a, a huge debate in uh, in the United States, actually, about whether this is a coup or not. I mean, this is this really a remarkable. Um, you, every time you have a coup, by the way, you have coup deniers, right? You had right. them in 1973 in Chile when Salvador Allende was toppled. And, you have, uh, and if you look back, um, you know, it's never simply a military coup. Right? You always have a group of people who are arguing that it's constitutional. Uh, you, um, they find uh, this and that reason for why the person should be overthrown. And there are always protests. And so that gives it, uh, you know, before the coup, uh, that gives it a sort of, you know, almost a legitimacy that there's, the people are behind it or something like that. But then, you know, history corrects uh, some of these, some of this narrative, and I remember having debates on various on the coup in Honduras in 2009. Mm -hmm. There was an attempted coup in my country in 2000 in 2010. Um, uh, the the one in, uh, in in Paraguay in 2012. I remember exactly the same debate taking place whether this was a coup or not. And you know, history corrects this. We all now call them coups. Um, certainly, the one in Bolivia was the pre pretty close to textbook sort of coup, right? So some middle class protest turned violent. Uh, you get more and more uh, sort of mixture between paramilitary, vigilante, sort of right-wing protests, taking over institutions, blocking roads, so on and so forth. Then you have a, a police mutiny, refusing to guarantee law and order, which seriously uh, curtails the capacity of the government to um, guarantee the rule of law. And then finally, the army, the military stepping in saying, uh, we call on the president's resignation. I mean, that, that is a coup. And, the, and then the president fleeing, uh, actually, his life was, we're, we're now unearthing how, to, to what extent Evo Morales, his life was really uh, a threat, um, uh, you know, and and then uh, the people sworn in, being having no democratic um, uh, authority, no democratic legitimacy whatsoever. It's important to remember that Evo Morales won 47% of the vote, right? I mean, right. Uh, the OS hasn't has been trying to, you know, argue that it wasn't. There were irregularities, but you know, they haven't really given numbers. But 47, uh, they certainly didn't question that, that he'd come in first place. Um, his right. closest contender was on 36. And if you look at the parliamentary elections, because there were presidential elections in Bolivia, but at the same time as you had elections in their Congress, so both Senate and lower house. Um, in both cases, in these elections, the MAS, so that's Evo Morales' party, uh, got a majority, right? So whichever way you look at it, Evo Morales' party won, they got a majority in Congress, they won the elections, they're the biggest party in the land, yeah? And yet, the person who's acting as caretaker president or de facto interim president, whatever you want to call her, her name is Janine Agnes, um, you know, uh, comes from a party that got uh, less than 4% of the vote, right? Um, and she's now talking of banning the mass from running in the upcoming elections. And if Evo Morales comes back to Bolivia, she wants to lock him up and, you know, all these kinds of things. So you're seeing an extremely authoritarian backlash institutionally. You're seeing um, lots of violence and repression on behalf of the security forces against uh, Morales' supporters and the supporters of the mass. You're seeing these symbols you were talking about of basically something that's happening all over uh, South America, 
um, it's uh, sort of a, a phenomenon you'll see in Brazil, mm-hmm. which is the sort of hard right evangelist vote, right? So you saw it with Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro's victory in Brazil, and you're seeing it with this coup here in Bolivia, uh, you know, Agnes, who um, was sworn in uh, as interim president um, in Congress without any Congress people being present almost, you know, um, and certainly no quorum to give validity to her swearing in process, uh, immediately went into the presidential palace with a gigantic Bible uh, shouting, the Bible's back in the palace. Um, and, you know, there's been a real move against the, what, the Wipala, which is that flag that the indigenous people use and that had been used by the Morales administration alongside the Bolivian flag. So there are all sorts of, again, going back to the argument on racism, um, the current um, interim de facto president, Janet Agnes, was famous as a congresswoman for for calling uh, indigenous customs satanic rights. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, this clear. is an extreme right-wing coup in every sense of the world, uh, word, both in the way it happened uh, and in the kind of uh, prejudice and racism and uh, attacks on civil rights uh, that are happening at the moment uh, just a few days after it took power. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.